So it's my great pleasure to be able to um, introduce uh, Dr. Josi Jacob uh, Ponodath, who is joining us from India, uh, where he is a principal of St. Thomas Orthodox uh, Theological Seminary in Nagpur. Uh, this is uh, one of the positions that he has now. So he's uh, been uh, very busy in the past with uh, uh, different, um, uh, he was a member of the Faculty of the Holy Trinity Theological College in Addis Ababa. So this is of course where he spent a lot of time. So he has uh, insight into not just the doctrine of uh, 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 orthodoxy, but actually also into the um, uh, uh, pr practice. So th this is uh, uh, these are questions. These these are facts which uh, allow us to uh, ask our speaker questions, both about his uh, uh, ideas uh, on a conceptual basis, and then also the uh, uh, practical experience that he accumulated in life. Um, I'm uh, extremely happy that he will be joining us today for this. Um, uh, uh, CWC uh, seminar uh, in um, uh, here at the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, and um, I uh, would like to pass the word over to um, uh, Dr. Jacob uh, now in order to allow him to introduce his topic and uh, to speak for about 20 minutes, half an hour, uh, Longer if you want to, shorter if you uh, if you uh, think that is appropriate, and then we can discuss the points that you raised. So thank you very much, and welcome here to to uh, our center at SOAS. Thank you, Dr. Lars. I'm uh, so much uh, happy and proud that I have got this chance to be with you with uh, CWC of uh, SOAS, the University of London, and uh, thanking Dr. Romana Strati who is a long-standing friend of mine for introducing me, and I'm so happy about that. So uh, the, the, the topic which we have already uh, decided to, to present today is the evangelical missions of the Managari Orthodox Church of India in 19th and 20th centuries, a reaction against the caste-based social structure. Here, I think I have to introduce two major things, major, major, major things which are related to the topic. One is the basic caste structure in general in India and in Kerala specifically. And I'm sure that most of you are very well aware of this uh, caste system, which is very prevalent in Indian society, which is really, uh, you know, really structured the Indian society or really uh, an agency which caste system is, it's, itself is, uh, is so crucial and influential in structuring the Indian society and you know it very Actually, uh, the general Indian caste system has is four tier plus one outcaste group. A four tier caste system with the Brahmins, the priestly class, the Kshatriyas, the ruling class, or the nobilities and the warriors together. And the, the third class, the Vaishyas, the mercantile class, and the Shudras, the labor class. And there is a big group of uh, outcaste people who are now popularly called Dalit. Dalit literally means the the word Dalit literally means broken. And they are called Panchamas traditionally. That means the fifth caste, which whom are outcasted, and they used to be regarded as subhuman people. And I'm not entering into the details of the, uh, the Hindu traditional understanding of uh, explaining this root of caste and all those things. But while coming to the very society of Kerala, which is a state in the southwestern part of India, uh, where the Malangara Orthodox Church or the, the St. Thomas Christian community uh, ha, is, 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 is surviving or is uh, originated. And uh, uh, it's, it's a prominent Christian community there in, in Kerala, actually. There in Kerala, we have to understand certain things uh, which are different from the general society of India. One thing is the caste system. In Keralite society, the caste system is not actually fourth tier, but plus three tire plus one. The Brahmins, the priestly class is existing. The Chatriyas, the second class is existing. The third class, the Vaisyas are not at all in Keralite society. The third class, the mercantile class is totally absent in Keralite caste structure. And the fourth class, Shudras, of course, they are there. And the fifth class, the Panchamas or the outcasted. But that outcasted also is graded in different ways. And then coming to the community of St. Thomas Christians, 
Of course, it is. Um, I'm sure that you all are scholars in, in this uh, field of social sciences, and you know that. St. Thomas Christian community is the traditional Christian community in Kerala. Uh, Kerala is in the south southwestern coast of India. It's a long strip of land with around 600 meters, 600 kilometers of length and 80 kilometers of width. It's a long strip of land with an entirely different uh, terrain comparing to the other, state, other states in India. And then with quite a different uh, social uh, structure, social patterns. And it's quite sociologically different from the other, other culturally also is different from the other parts of India and the other Indian community, the other societies in India. In Keralite society, the St. Thomas Christian community is regarded as one among the high caste uh, in, the, in the caste structure. Assimilation of a particular Christian community existing there for at least for many centuries, or at least for more than, more than one and a half millennium, uh, has been assimilated or has been accepted as a part of the higher caste society or the or the, the society in its uh, you know the elite class of the society eventually and then according to the traditional beliefs of the saint thomas christian community in kerala the founder of the christian community in india or the traditional christian community in india is apostle saint thomas himself and then uh, the community to which i belong believes that saint thomas the apostle traveled all the ways from uh, uh, Palestine to Kerala to the to the to, to a part in Kerala in, and he established the church in, uh, in in 50 to 80 and then the church is still continuing without any historical interruption that's what we traditionally believe and I'm not entering into the details of that and I'm not trying to prove that because it is not totally historically proven a fact but it is a long-standing tradition that it is there and then the presence of a Christian community, at least from third century, is almost a proven, a proven fact. It could be an extension of the Mesopotamian Christian community, and I'm not entering into the details of that also because it is not coming under the scope of our subject. But what I want to highlight is that, you know, as this Christian community, the St. Thomas Christian community is existing in the state of Kerala, in the society of Kerala, for many long years or many long centuries, it became accepted as a part of uh, the higher caste privileged community. The privileged, it became a part of the privileged community. And certain of the historians of, uh, of the current historians like uh, Dr. Kurian Thomas, I specifically wish to mention his name. And he is the one who tries to bring an argument that the third caste is totally absent in uh, uh, the Indian society and that third caste used to be the mercantile caste, the traders, and then ma majority of the Syrian Christians in early times used to be engaged, used to engage in, in this uh, mercantile activity. So they used to take, take uh, to, to replace the role of uh, the mercantile class in the Caroline society and they literally replace the third caste and that's why a third caste, the mercantile caste is practically absent in the Caroline uh, caste hierarchy, and I'm not um, quite sure that that argument is generally accepted by the other historians, and I'm not quite sure that he can produce uh, ample evidences to prove his hypothesis, and so I'm not, uh, uh, what's it called, I'm not arguing that it is a right uh, right understanding or a, it's, it's properly factually acceptable. But it is quite an interesting observation a bright historian has made recently that the Syrian Christian community's assimilation into the Keralite society is practically replacing the third caste, uh, uh, the Vaishyas, the, the mercantile class. That is something to be noted. Anyway, it is interesting that uh, Syrian Christian community is, you know, ha has got, has an, an you know, uh, enjoy a lot of privileges in the Indian, so the Kerala social system. The privileges which they have uh, enjoyed were almost equal to the privileges of uh, the higher caste Hindus. And that is, we have got ample evidences for uh, the, the fact that the Syrian Christians used to enjoy different privileges which were granted to them as a group of ethnic, as an ethnic group. The caste system, as you know, it is ethnically endogamic groups, 
ethnically endogamy groups. The Syrian Christians or St. Thomas Christians, uh, the so-called St. Thomas Christians or Syrian Christians of Kerala are also almost keeping their endogamy even today, not very strictly, but they are so concerned. Traditionally, they are very concerned about their endogamy, which is a common characteristic which we could notice among all the, all the uh, Hindu higher caste people all through India, all over India, and specifically in Kerala too. So what I really want to, 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 to uh, argue is that St. Thomas Christians practically got assimilated or they actually got assimilated into the Keralite society for many centuries, but they have never involved in any sort of serious evangelical missionary activities until the late 19th century. We don't have any, any specific evidence that the St. Thomas Christian community uh, involved in engaged in any sort of missionary activity in Kerala until the late 19th century. One of the reasons is that the privileges which they were enjoyed were something of the highest higher caste Hindus and then the caste system is unlike the class or uh, unlike any, any, any other uh, social stratification system. Caste system demands a strict endogamy to keep the ethnic identity intact. So the Syrian Christians also practically used to follow the same system of endogamy. Endogamy was so much a particular, uh, what's it called, a particular uh, aspect of their ethos. So that, that prevented them from making anyone uh, joining their community, even though it is a religious uh, community, even though it was a religious, it, it was a Christian community, this endogamic attitude and their specific consciousness of their higher caste uh, identity and the social status in Keralite society, status in Keralite society uh, pr practically prevented, actually, that's what I believe, prevented them from engaging in evangelical mission. Then the concept of extensive evangelical mission was introduced into Indian society as a whole in general was uh, by the Portuguese people. The Portuguese mission was began in 1506. Uh, in 1498, Vasco da Gama uh, arrived uh, Kerala, Kangano. It's one of the one of the port cities of Kerala then, then Kerala, and then in 1506, Francis Xavier a Catholic uh, monk priest began his formal mission, evangelical mission in one of the western, central western states of India called Goa. And then it has been extended down to Kerala too through the coast. This coastal mission uh, of Francis Xavier and the Portuguese missionaries was practically the first extensive missionary activity, evangelical missionary activity uh, done in India. And after that, in uh, 19th century, uh, the British people came and the church mission society also did a lot of missionary activities. But their missionary activities uh, were just converting people mostly, mostly and almost uh, the main, practically all of them, practically actually all of them were converted from the group of Panjabas, that means the people who were outcasted and the outcasted people were converted to Christianity by this Portuguese people and the British people uh, in, starting from 16th century and through uh, you know, almost up to the middle of 20th century, that mission was very active, missions were very active. What happened with those missionary communities, they were converted to Christianity, but they continued to remain as Dalit Christian communities because their Dalit identity was not taken off and Dalit, they continued to be Dalit Christian communities because all the members in their community were Dalit people. All the members in their community were converted from this lowest caste or the Panchamas, the outcasted people, and they continued to be labeled as a Dalit Christian community or Panchamas Christian community or the lowest caste community. And the first serious evangelical activity of activity of the Malangara Orthodox Church, which is uh, the most traditional 
uh, sect in the St. Thomas Christian community began in late the fourth quarter of 19th century. The Malangar, the St. Thomas Christian community, which is a traditional Christian community in India, has been divided into three, all the three general groups of Christianity as uh, certain people joined the Catholic Church by the influence of the Portuguese people, and certain of them joined the uh, Reformed Church, the, the Anglican Church, and joined in communion with the Anglican Church, and they became a Reformed group. And then a, a, a sect of them, a group of them remained uh, with this continued uh, with the Orthodox community. And then, uh, but generally, their, their the interesting thing is that their endogamy is not practically affecting this church affiliations. They are still, still trying to continue uh, to understand it as one ethnic community. Not, we don't explicitly, I belong to that community, so I know it from inside. I can, I have an, uh, I, I have an uh, emic perspective of that. So, but I, I hope I will, I will be trying to be more objective on that. But so this endogamy is in the heart of the community still in the heart of the community. But that endogamy, end, endogamy is not seriously uh, challenging or that, that endogamy is not seriously considering the, the, the church affiliations, whether they belong to the reform group or they belong to the Catholic group or they belong to the Orthodox group, they don't seriously mind. So I would say that it is more an ethnic consciousness than a religious thing or, or a denominational thing. That is, that, is, that is what I want to highlight. There. But in the 19th century, one of the great visionary bishops, Saint Gregorius of uh, Parimala, we call him Saint Gregorius of Parimala, he uh, began the mission, missionary activities of the church and then he decided to kind of took a lot of initiative to convert many of the uh, lower caste people into Orthodox Christianity, into the Malangara Orthodox Syrian Church, which is the which is the most, which is a very prominent um, group in the, among the St. Thomas Christians. And then he was so particular to convert the Dalit to the Malangara Orthodox Church, and he was uh, very keen uh, to keep them as a part of the community. As a part of the community, he wanted to extend the identity of the community to the newly converted people. As I have already uh, already mentioned, the the mission evangelical missions done by the Portuguese people and the evangelical missions done by the Church Mission Society of the British people uh, converted a lot of people. The number of converts were much more than the converts made by uh, or, or the people who were brought to Christianity by Saint Gregorius of Parabola. And I'm calling him Saint Gregorius because he was declared a a saint uh, by the church uh, 45 years after his death in 1947. He, saint Gregorius passed away in 1902 and then uh, he passed away at the age of 54 at a very young age. And then uh, he was declared a saint in 1947. He was the first declared saint of the Orthodox Church of India. And his specific interest was not simply to convert them uh, to Christianity, but to integrate them into the into the, into the Malagare Orthodox Church, which is a part of the Syrian Christian community. And then that really brought big changes in their lives. Their status has been elevated from the untouchables to uh, members of the Syrian Christian community to a great extent. Even then, even then, the community or the members of the community did not accept them into the endogamic system of, of, of the community. Even when if they were allowed to participate in the, in, the, in the liturgies, in the worship and in social activities together with the other members of the church. But when it comes to the, to the mar marital relationship, they were so particular for many, many decades even after uh, to keep the endogamy. Then this in the social realm of uh, Kerala, this conversions made by St. Gregorius brought a lot of changes. Then the untouchability of uh, the Panchamas or the fifth caste people or the outcasted people uh, were so much a social taboo or social problem which they were facing and their lives were very much uh, 
in trouble because of this so-called uh, the problem of untouchability. But by the conversion of uh, these people into the Orthodox Church, they got the identity. They, they, they began to share the identity of the St. Thomas Christians by becoming the members of the Orthodox Church of, uh, of uh, India. And that really brought significant changes in their lives. And that really brought a social status elevation for, for uh, those who joined. And then uh, this bishop was uh, a short-lived person. I told you that he died at the age of 54. And then it is so unfortunate that nobody took up that responsibility and continued the mission until uh, the, the second quarter of the 20th century. Another person uh, who his name was MP Peter, and then he was a very well educated young man and was appointed as a as an officer for taking care of this uh, lower caste people by the king of Kochi, which is a uh, small state in uh, Kerala. Kerala was divided into three uh, states, uh, sovereign states by of uh, king kingdoms, uh, three kingdoms, and then. The central kingdom was called the kingdom of Kochi and the king of Kochi has appointed this bright young man from this Malagara Orthodox Church, the Serbian Christian community as, a, as, 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 a, as an officer who is supposed to take care, officer for taking care of this lower caste people. And he was called the Pulea special officer and then he was given, his office was given judicial powers. And then when he began to interact with these people, he realized that you know these people cannot get a, better living condition and they cannot uh, be integrated into the society without taking them out of the clutches of the Hindu hierarchy, caste hierarchy. So then well, he, he, with all his dedication, began to uh, make involved in the evangelical mission, resigning his bureaucratic position and he joined a monastery and then he became a monk priest and then he involved in evangelical mission with a specific orientation to bring them into the mainstream of the society, to integrate them into the mainstream of the society. What he tried to do was uh, not simply extending a an identity to them, but he tried to, to bring them into the mainstream of the society by uh, providing facilities for education and health care to the poor, to the to the Panjamas who are, who who, uh, who joined the, the the Orthodox Church of uh, India in uh, the second half. Second, and his works were uh, extended to mainly his works were the second and the third quarters of uh, 20th century. And then through his works, this integration became became seriously possible. And then in the independent India too, they, the integration continued, but later uh, there was a problem from the, from the side of the government that, you know, government has decided to uh, cancel the reservation rights extended to these people, the Dalits uh, cancel the reservation. They, they stopped providing the reservation rights to the Christians who joined, or who integrated into the mainstream of uh, the church. Because they say that this reservation right is for the Dalits who are facing caste-based oppression, and the, the 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 Dalits who left Hindu hierarchical structure by joining Christianity is not a, no more facing this oppression, so they don't need to get any reservation or any extra support from the government. That was a really a problematic situation for them because they were they they were given a privilege to be members of the church and they were regarded as uh, you know regarded as the members of uh, the saint thomas christian community but their socio economic conditions were not that much better comparing to the other uh, other uh, members other, uh, members of the dalit community who continue to belong to uh, belong to the Hindu uh, religious uh, groups. So uh, what I want to highlight is that the interest of the church leaders and even the church is concerned about that interest that the bringing them to Christianity is shouldn't be for simply for the sake of converting them and to add the number of people into the church, not to add to the bulk of the church, but to bring them into the mainstream of the social life. And I don't think that today there is a serious significance for that. And then this uh, opened a new understanding in the mission 
aspects of all the churches and then later uh, the communities the different churches in uh, syrian christian communities like as uh, a catholic group in the syrian christian community continued to follow this path <laughs> and they also involved in serious missionary activities to bring these south caste people and people of the lower class the so called dalits into uh, into their church and they also got this integrated uh, they they also got this privilege by integrating themselves into the a uh, mainstream of the church another important thing which i want to highlight is that these two bishops the gregorius and uh, uh, the uh, saint um, Mo Mo bishop ostatius who uh, whose former name was uh, mr peter uh, they insisted the syrian christian families to extend their names to give their family names to this newly converted people because family names play a crucial role in keralite society in determining to which group they do belong so i don't know uh, how far it is in the west in in keralite society the, the syrian christians used to have their own family names and these family names are really determinant factors in in uh, you know uh, in expressing their social status and then these bishops particularly we are so particular to extend family names of the syrian christians to the newly converted and that really worked and then their integration into the mainstream of the society was so uh, easy in that regard and then eventually i believe that you know as a, as we are not as eventually uh, with this family names and with their complete integration into the system endogamy is eventually uh, uh, getting a little bit uh, open and then they are also getting integrated into the society in many regards and uh, this perspective of mission is something which is to be studied properly with an anthropology perspective i believe and not only from the perspective of uh, christianity and uh, not only from a missionary evangelical perspective or not only from the perspective of theology but it is to be seen uh, from a sociological perspective and i just i just wish to highlight this aspect to you and then uh, uh, this is what i really want to want to raise an issue before you and i am so happy for uh, uh, for the discussions if uh, you raise questions and i will be very happy to uh, be a part of the discussion thank you well thank i don't know how far i was clear in presenting yeah, this yeah. <laughs> very very clear actually and um since um i um, um well as a historian i uh, i recognize some of the um uh, the place names as well and, uh, but uh, i'm not not an expert in the um in the social structure of kerala but what you said is uh, is definitely uh, something that i uh, um, i recognize from uh, for example the middle east where you have uh, uh, literally um well endogamous societies which uh, are defined by religious uh, affiliation and um, this is something that you get very well, um, if there are people who go against this um, a mainstream, uh, then uh, you get uh, very determined reactions by the uh, by by let's say let's call them um, family members um, uh, or representatives of uh, conservative representatives of a representatives of a conservative society. Um, but uh, uh, so this also works in societies where a formal caste system does not exist but it's um but but uh, this uh, is perhaps something that we can discuss in the um in the next few minutes um so uh, who would like to ask a question Shihan or joe or richard i should say that i've received a number of um uh, messages uh, by <laughs> members of the center who can't get in they um, it's um uh, one of them is Romina, but uh, but, but she's uh, actually in uh, uh, Addis Ababa at the moment, and she is uh, in a meeting, so she can't uh, she she can't join in uh, online. Uh, but um, uh, others are online, but they uh, they say it's impossible to get in. So I, uh, I yes, that's unfortunately what I what I feared that that um, the internet is not uh, strong enough, or there is a problem with the internet. But so those of us who are here, we will need to lead the discussion, and we will need to we will need to um, make up for the um, for our members who are outside the door, so to speak. Shihan, uh, would you like to ask something? Yes. Or you need to 
you and uh, I think you're mute. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for that very uh, stimulating talk. Um, I have several questions. One is, I am from Sri Lanka, so I'm familiar with the Portuguese. And I'm talking yes. of social setup after independence. And we had the Dutch and the British after the Portuguese, all about 150 years each. Yes, yes. So um, is one quiz is the family names which you mentioned, like my own name, De Silva, uh, surname. Uh -huh. So that is an identifier. Okay, so if you if the people took those names on at the time of conversion during Portuguese times, the question is why didn't they change when the Portuguese lost power during the Dutch and the British times? And there is a, a pecking order of European descendants, the British at the top, the Dutch at the second and the Portuguese third. So Portuguese is not a good descendant to be today. It's a no. low, <laughs> low end of the social spectrum. So why do the Sinhalese and the Tamils, the majority, uh, who are not even uh, Christians or Catholics, who are Hindus and Buddhists even, carry on with these names like Fernando and Piris and Kure and, you know, an identifier to the Portuguese. During that time, okay, colonial times, it's a social badge, a kind of a westernization. But what benefit yes. is there in, in independent times when nationalistic thing is to become all, you know, Sinhala and Buddhist, the majority? So, it's a bit of a dilemma. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, let me say, uh, what I mentioned is about the Keralite community, the Keralite traditional Christian society. We never accepted any, any family name, uh, either from Portuguese or nor from, uh, we, we, had, we never accepted either from Portuguese or from Dutch or from British. It's traditional, my name itself is, must be very strange to you. My family name is Ponodath, P-O-N-O-D-H, and that is, that is that is that indicates what uh, to, uh, what category of a family I'm from only in my locality, and then that is that is a peculiar kind of uh, social structure existing in uh, in uh, the Keralite society, and it is it is typically a, a Keralite family name, and then uh, this family names are shared with the people who joined. That is that is what I mentioned. And it's not, it's not an adaptation of family names from any of the uh, foreign agencies who came over here, the colonial powers who came over here, but this, this uh, but you know, when, when my, when my uh, grandfather was alive, certain people who were living around my, my ancestral properties got converted by this uh, Bishop Marostatios or uh, MP Peter, I mentioned earlier. Then it, he was so particular to share and uh, naturally, it happened that you know they have uh, assumed the family names of uh, uh, the, the major families of Syrian Christians whom in, in proximity, in proximity. That's how they got integrated into the community. When after one or two generations, when they mention their names and they can mention this name as their family name, then uh, the discrimination is eventually uh, eventually got reduced. That is what I mentioned. And then. Uh, Family names with the Western, Western, you know, Western family names are with the people who are mostly converted by the British people. So, uh, sorry, mostly converted by the Portuguese people and uh, the British. And the Dutch period in Kerala was too short a period, and I don't think that there are Dutch family names. But you know, Portuguese and British family names are there. But that family names keeps them very clearly distinct that they are uh, converted by the Western missionaries or Western mission, uh, West, Western mission, missionary, uh, Western missionaries actually, that's it. But when they, assume, when they, when they act, when they hold the family names of typical Caroline Syrian Christians and they have a different uh, social status, that's what I mentioned, you know, not a social status, but you know, you can understand that their integration into the society is much more easier than uh, holding a Western family name. Yes. Thank you. And I just wondered about the first uh, Thomas Christians. How did the, the linguistic barriers they had, What? how did they overcome them? Did the converts understand what they were converting to or were they? No, actually the St. Thomas Christians in Kerala, Kerala is having one language and the Indian states are mostly divided as linguistic states, not ethnic states. You know, ethnic cities are, are, are always overlapping everywhere. And then uh, ethnic groups are not there, but ethnic classes or the castes are there in India. That is, 
something making Indian society very peculiar. If you, if in, in Africa, of course, and I'm familiar with Africa because I have uh, uh, lived in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia for 16 years, so I know the African system. In Africa, ethnic groups are there, but in India, there is no ethnic group, but ethnic classes or ethnic classes can be called ethnic caste. Castes are there. Ethnicity is divided into castes in India, but linguistic divisions are there when uh, states were constituted in India in 1950 and after. So Kerala is having one single language, which is called Malayalam. Malayalam. This, so there was no language barrier in conversion of people because Keralite, uh, the St. Thomas Christian or the Malagara Orthodox Church's mission was mostly focused within Kerala itself where we are following the same language. Of course, different uh, slangs are there in different parts of Kerala, but mostly the same language. And then only one a sect of people who joined uh, to the church from the Catholic Church. That was not an evangelical mission. I wouldn't count it as an evangelical mission. A group of people joined uh, the Orthodox Church whom were earlier converted by the Portuguese people. And that joining of that group uh, occurred in the late 19th century. And that was that was not a part of evangelical mission. We didn't convert anyone from outside Kerala who were having a different language. Okay, and uh, so because in Sri Lanka, linguists say that the first time people understood religion, the word of God, oh. was the Wesleyan, through the Wesleyan church, which is a working class oh. kind of church, and that the previous converts didn't understand what they were converting into. So, I mean, how, I mean, they converted due to what they could get jobs or the, their social prestige, you know, for those reasons, not really understanding what they were converting to in terms of religion. But I think I think uh, here in, in, in uh, the Kerala society, that means the conversion when it happened in late 19th century, the bishop was involving in conversion was really seriously, seriously making it as a matter of the church. And then he was a very, very, very genuine person. And he became a bishop at the age of 29 and passed away at the age of 54. And such a dedicated man he was, and then he was so particular to bring them to Christianity with all its uh, uh, content, and it was not for social status he did. He, he, he taught them properly the faith of the church, but at the same time, he was so concerned to bring them into the mainstream society by integrating them into the church. And then it was not only simply for social uplifting of the community, but it was uh, the, the intention was really to, to bring them to uh, Christian faith. So uh, the number of converts were, were, uh, you know, who joined the church in the Managra Orthodox Church is much smaller than the number of converts who joined into uh, the, the other churches, especially uh, to the church in communion with the CMS missionaries or church in communion with the Portuguese uh, church or Catholic church. It is significantly smaller, but the, the intention was uh, not simply social uplifting or not simply adding number to the uh, to the to the to the church, but it was for both. Br in it was for both. Thank you. Thank you, uh, yes, yes, Richard. Sir. We have your hand. Yes. Oh. Um, I, I want to go back in time to when I was about fifteen or sixteen, which is around nineteen sixty-one, I think, when I think the the Goanese, the sorry, the Goa was taken over by Krishna Menon or instigated that, I remember it very well. And my late father, who was a master mariner, he was a, a captain in the British India line. And the saloon crew on British India line ships with by and large were from Goa. And I mm. remember going on my father's ship in the docks when it came there. And many, many of the, the Goanese, uh, including the butler, were very, very upset and worried about uh, the, the, you know, the, the invasion of Goa, because they did not want the caste system. It was, you know, some of them were even crying about it. Um, and that, that sticks in my memory very much indeed. That, that's just a, 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 a thought about what, what, in a way, it's not a total digression from what we're talking about, but it, it was a reality it, it, when, it, in 1961. Hmm. Yeah, of course, the situation in Goa and uh, Kerala are much different, actually. In Kerala society has got its... Kerala society has undergone serious uh, evolutions because of many reasons. And then uh, I am sorry that I apologize that I cannot speak very authentically on uh, the situation in Goa, which I'm 
and uh, so I'm, I'm not uh, capable of making a serious comment on that matter. I think. But in, in, if uh, you have anything related to uh, the Christian society in Kerala, uh, I hope I will be uh, more able to make comments on that. Uh -huh. I have a question that leads directly from what uh, uh, Jihan de Silva said earlier on, um, namely uh, languages uh, and the understanding of the, the, the gospel by uh, the first converts. Uh, from what point onwards do we get a printed, um, a pr printed catechisms and uh, is a similar literature that is meant to explain the um, uh, the gospel. Is it um, uh, is it from the? I mean that that would be in the um, uh, speaking to those who were actually able to read. So it would have to be. A, it's also a literacy question. You know who is literate at that point, and if. Um, if they belong to the outcasts, are there schools that cater? Were there schools that cater specifically for the uh, for, for the castless um, or outcast um, um, people, children? Yes, uh, the Bible was translated uh, into Malayalam and was published for the first time in 1829. And that was that was you know, translation was uh, done by. A, by mostly under the auspices of the British British missionaries, uh, especially a uh, famous missionary group, and then local, uh, certain of the local priests of the Malagara Orthodox Church also got involved in the translation. And but the publication was done by the famous missionaries, and then we are really thankful for that uh, to the famous missionary group. And then the question is very very interesting, and it is very very much an important question. I feel that you know the. the the Dalits or the, the, the outcasted people were kept powerless by keeping themselves away from education. Epistemological divide which the traditional society, uh, society built up between the, the, the upper caste of the people and the lower caste of the people really kept them deprived of any sort of acquisition of knowledge. That really kept them weak and powerless for generations and generations. And it is the it is a the, the Western missionaries, especially the British missionaries, who brought a serious change into that situation. And it is CMS missionaries who brought a, a chance for them to learn in systematic schools. And then it is because of the works of the CMS missionaries and the Catholic Church too. I have to say the Catholic Church too. I don't specifically say the Portuguese missionaries, but the later Catholic Church seriously got involved and then uh, it is interesting to say that you know palli palli in uh, malayalam palli p a l l i palli in malayalam means the church and then the name for the school the word for the school is palli kudam palli kudam means the attachment the the, the, the annexure of the church the annexure of the church that is that is an interesting that is pointing to an interesting fact that you know education was established in uh, uh, was provided in the schools. And then I'm so proud to say that uh, the English education began systematically in, I and I heard that in India, at least in Kerala, for the first time is in our seminary, which was established in 1815. And then we began this systematic foreign language education in India, uh, began in our seminary in 1815. And the Church of Balagar Church was so particular to bring uh, the light of education and uh, to, the, to all, all members and the all, 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 to the all people of Kerala. And then the church also runs a lot of schools. And then, uh, of course, I, we have to thank uh, uh, the CMS missionaries for their great vision. Uh, that's a very, very good question, that was. Yes, because I was thinking of the Jesuits in Goa. That is the connection that I got earlier on from. Uh, and at present, uh, for for many for many decades, Kerala is having the highest literacy rate in all through India. Uh -huh. Kerala is a state with the rural and the urban, but you know its literacy rate is mostly ninety nine plus because uh, it's it's ninety nine plus, and then in healthcare and in in education, Kerala is far advanced than the other states. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other questions? Joe, maybe. Uh, no? Can I, can I ask yes, one? Yes, absolutely. Yes, please. please, please. Um, we, um, uh, there was the Indo-Portuguese of Cochin. I don't know, think there was a local name. Linguists call it Indo-Portuguese of Cochin. So, uh, but uh -huh. in Sri Lanka in 18, 
20s, earlier than what you said, we have Bibles in the in the Portuguese of Ceylon, Robert Newstead. So oh. I just wondered whether you have Catholic uh, Bibles, you know, Bibles that the Catholic Church translated into the Indo Portuguese of Portuguese. I don't think, you know, as far as I understand, the Catholic Church was not so particular to translate Bible and to make it available to the people until 1964, the 63 to 65, until the Second Vatican Council. The Catholic Church was not so particular to do that, actually. Uh, in the in 19th century, the Catholic Church never published any, they never uh, made any Bible available to the, to, to the common public. And the biblical knowledge was uh, given to the people through the readings made by the with the priest in the church and through the sermons that is that was a policy of the general catholic church so as well as i understand the catholic church was not so much enthusiastic in translating the bible into any local vernacular uh, and it was it was the interest of the portuguese sorry it was the interest of the of the protestant protestant missionaries the reformed missionaries to bring bible into the hands of everyone in a way they can understand it that means into the local vernacular so that is that is what I understand. It is not about the Catholic mission. I'm not saying that the Catholics were not enthusiastic in conducting their mission, evangelical activity, but not very much enthusiastic in bringing Bible to the hands of the ordinary people. Yeah. That is and, a policy of the Catholic Church in general, not only uh, of the missionaries in either in India or in Sri Lanka. So they wanted to maintain some kind of differential between the church and the. Uh, could, could you make it clear? Did they want to maintain some kind of gap between the church, the you know, the clergy and the people? Ah, ah that was uh, that was there in the Catholic Church <laughs> at least, at least until the Second Vatican Council. And they would say Second Vatican Council brought a lot of light into the Catholic uh, uh, way of thinking. And then before that, of course, it was there, and the the sacred profane distinction was so so clearly kept there in the Catholic understanding. And uh, the clergy and the laity difference was there, and that is that's a that's that's a fact. And we, I'm, I'm not I'm not criticizing that, but that is that was real. That was real as far as I understand. And you mentioned and the, the, yes, you mentioned there was an absence of the vices, yes, the trading caste. Yes, there is practically there is some absence of the vices, the third caste, the trading caste in Kerala. That is true. That is yes. very true. Why, why did it happen? Is it unique in India not to have a... Um, no, it's, it's unique in India. I think it's unique in India. The caste system in the northern side of India. I Actually, I live in the north India. I'm originally from Kerala. At present, I'm in Kerala and I will be moving to the northern side of India the day after tomorrow. So then uh, in the northern side of Kerala, you can see clearly distinct four castes and the Panchamas, the fifth caste, the Brahmanas, the priestly class, the Kshatriyas, the rulers and the high-ranking warriors. Uh, and third, the Vaishyas, the, the, the traders, and uh, the, 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 the Shudras, the general laborers, and uh, the outcasted are not allowed to enter into the, into the habitats of these uh, upper caste people and to the mainstream society and even to the main roads earlier. Not now, not now, earlier. Then in Kerala, you can see the Brahmanas very clearly distinct. You can you can understand you can identify the Kshatriyas who are the ruling class and the high-ranking warriors, and then you can see the Shudras who are the laborers, and then some of them are uh, used to be used to be in the warrior group, not as high-ranking warriors, but uh, the soldiers. But you, the third caste, the vice caste, the trading class is ab completely absent, so totally you, absent. Yeah, I mean it's on the coast. Why would there be? Why wouldn't they want to? Train? Syrian Christians or the Saint Thomas Christian community was almost occupying that role. That is historically a reality. They were almost occupying the role, and then their Christian identity they used it very well for uh, their trade purpose. I think when this when this when this Europeans came and then they 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 could very well uh, interact with them because of their Christian identity. I think it is it is not an established fact. Anyway, the Syrian Christians and the Muslims used to involve in this uh, uh, trading activities in Kerala, and then uh, that could be one of the reasons that you know this uh, third third caste, the Vaisyas, the trading caste, is practically absent. And it is true that third caste is not in the hierarchy of uh, caste hierarchy of Kerala society. Yeah. So you probably have a historically a landowning class. If they were not trading, they were rich because they were. Uh, land ownership was mostly with the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas, the top two, and then eventually it came down to the other two. That means, you know, the Syrian Christians and to the and to the uh, Shudras and to Muslims too. 
the land ownership of the dalits in kerala it was it was not an established fact their ownership of the land is can be traced back to only to 1950s when the communist government of kerala kerala is a state where communist government the first communist government came into power through a ballot an open ballot that means you know by by election uh, by the, in a democratic manner that is in 1950 that was in 1956 i think and they made the land re reforms and then through their land reforms it that it's also got ownership in that until that time they were not given ownership they were possessing some land but you know uh, uh, the ownership used to be with the with the either of the hair caste hindus or of syrian christians or of muslim something like that so uh, we don't have any any uh, any document which is uh, uh, clearly speaking about the land ownership of the dalits Thank you. Uh, yes, Joe, I see uh, your hand going up there. Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you so much. And apologies for popping in and out like that. I, um, I have been focusing and listening even despite my jumping around. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, my field is, is sub-Saharan Africa, particularly be, um, South, Southern African uh, Christian history. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that struck me in your discussion is that it seems as if your um, St. Thomas uh, group it, and uh, with an orthodox sort of background is engaging in something that we contemporarily call liberation theology. Is there some kind of that sort of social uplift that you're talking about is there something in that orthodox doctrine that lends itself to to being understood in that way? Yes, you know, I don't want to put it. Uh, I don't know whether we can put it in the category of the liberation theology, but social uplifting was always a concern because the orthodox Christianity, especially the Malagro orthodox understanding, is that the purpose of incarnation of uh, of God the Son is to is to enhance or to empower the humanity physically, mentally. Uh, spiritually and socially so this empowerment is the very purpose which we were trying to to to, to extend empowering the humanity empowering the humanity by bringing to, by physically empowering spiritually empowering mentally and socially empowering so we we converted them to christianity with great vigor and then we tried to extend them education and then uh, their hygiene and healthcare were taken very seriously and it was I, I and I don't know whether the approach of uh, liberation theology and the approach of the great uh, missionary leaders of uh, the Kerala society were exactly in the same line, but in the very purpose, in the in the core of the issue, in the in, the, in, the, in their in the core of their uh, minds, I, of course, there are similarities. The purpose is practically the same. That is so interesting because actually, the. Um, the sort of uh, historiography of liberation theology is dated from the South American uh, theologist uh, Gutierrez, whose name I've never been able to pronounce. Um, yes, but, Gustavo, but, Gustavo Gutierrez. Yes, right. Gustavo Gutierrez, and he That's was he was from Peru. He was from Peru. Yeah, yes, and he was from I, Peru. Uh, in in uh, yeah. So so I found. Traces of uh, what he what, what was called liberation theology in the in the nineteenth century in the in the Southern African um, situation, but um, and uh, you're right to use the word empowerment because that is the core that seems to be um, common uh, and um, the same kind of non-confrontational you know it's not an exilic it's not an um, a call to overthrow it's a call to build from within so that's yes. really really interesting thank you so and much. i as i know my, the, the church in the orthodox church of india and generally the orthodox churches and the orthodox church of india doesn't want to highlight this sort of eschatological no. uh, hope-based christianity of course it is it must be realistic and um, I don't know whether our focus is totally matching with this the, the focus of the liberation of the audience because they are more focusing on uh, the liberation or the uplifting of the people in this world, and then we have a balanced approach, more 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 uh, more an approach of uh, keeping both sides equally 
important. important. And then M, M, and healthcare and education were major focuses of these bishops and by integrating them into Christianity. Um, may I just follow up with a little question? Um, w was this um, um, upliftment and empowerment aimed at both men and, or girls and boys or men and women? Or, or yes, of course. You know, it is, that, is, that is an interesting question. I'm so happy that you, I'm thankful to you for raising that question. You know, this St. Gregorius of uh, Marimara, the, the, the bishop who lived in the late 19th century, he is the one who, was, who prompted or he, and under his leadership, was the first school for girls got established in Carolite society. The wow. conservative Caroline society, especially the Syrian Christians and the upper class Hindus, were not allowing them, allowing their, they, 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 they were not allowing their uh, children to join the schools where boys are studying. So that was so conservative of them in 19th century. So then uh, then Gregorius didn't try to change that attitude, but what he tried to do is that he established school for girls so that he, they, they also could join. And then he, he continuously talked to, uh, continuously tried to propagate the idea that the girls shouldn't be enslaved in kitchen. They should be sent to school and they must be empowered with education and all of that. It was his interest that brought many schools for girls established in 19th century. And in nine, later, uh, later, of course, the education was open for men and women. But in 19th century itself, he was so particular to bring. And then uh, for both, for, for, for uh, girls in the Syrian Christian community, traditional Christian community, and for the converted adults. It was open for both. It was not. It was. It was not. It was uh, neither religion based nor caste based, but just the gender only for girls. Because if boys were allowed there, they, the parents wouldn't send girls over there. And in 19th century, so, so he allowed only only girls to, the, to join the school, and then that really brought a lot of difference in the Carolite society. Right? For you know, in, as far as in regard to uh, empowering uh, uh, women, women empowerment. But unfortunately, he was short lived and then passed away in 1902. I have one question which I've um, uh, been keeping in the back because it's, it sounds quite ignorant. But um, what is it that makes the um, uh, Orthodox Christians in Kerala Orthodox? Uh, are there theological um, aspects which are which would uh, set them apart from the Catholic tradition? But I know yes. it's it's the it's it's an ancient Saint Thomas that, that is an ancient uh, offshoot uh, of the original Christians. But uh, um, in concrete terms, because you mention um, the development of the Catholic Church with Second Vatican Council, you mentioned the the Protestant missionaries, uh, but. Um, an Orthodox, um, you know, the Orthodox Church, what, what does it uh, uh, retain in terms of theology that makes it Orthodox? Uh, that's a good question, actually. The uh, Malagara Orthodox Church, or the, the so-called Indian Orthodox Church, is belonging to the Oriental Orthodox family. And then, you know, that now the, which, is, uh, which, includes only, which includes only six uh, churches, uh, the Coptic, the Egyptian, uh, the Syrian, and uh, the Ethiopic, and the Eritrean, the Armenian, mm -hmm. and the Indian. And then we, the Syrian Christian community uh, in India, were not very much uh, in, into the classification of either into, into Catholic or Orthodox uh, uh, in the early phase of uh, their history. That means until 16th century, that means in the pre-Portuguese period, Portuguese people came to, Christian, came to India in uh, the late 15th century, in 1498 only, Vasco de Gama came and then their active participation in the social life of India began in 16th century. And until 16th century, the identity of the Christians in Kerala was not very much uh, uh, established as either Orthodox or uh, Catholic or in any way, any other ways. But uh, the interference of the Portuguese people brought some problems in the society. And then the church was divided and one group joined the the Catholic Communion in 1599, the, whole, the, the Portuguese, Portuguese rulers tried to bring the whole of the traditional Christian community of Kerala into, into uh, the Catholic Church and then they, uh, they were forced to. And then in 1653, there was a separation occurred. There was a reaction against the Portuguese uh, uh, rule, Portuguese uh, religious 
and dom domination and then many of the atrocities which they uh, claim to happen there during the Portuguese period there in India. Anyway, after that, uh, when they got separated from the Portuguese communion or Portuguese, the, when they got separated from the Catholic communion as a reaction against the Portuguese and then the Portuguese activities and then the Portuguese are the, brought, the one who uh, brought them into Catholic church. And then as a reaction, they departed from the Catholic communion and then they uh, seek the help of uh, certain Orthodox churches in the Middle East and then the Syrian Orthodox church bishops and the missionaries came over there and they eventually accepted the Syrian Orthodox faith and that's how we began to be uh, known as Orthodox and then we are sharing the faith of the Syrian Orthodox church who uh, sent bishops and uh, clerics for our training and then for uh, keeping the, the Episcopal succession there in uh, the Indian Orthodox Church. And then we have a lot of similarities in liturgy. Practically, we are we, we, we have adopted the liturgical uh, systems of the Syrian Orthodox Church and the faith of the church. But the church still remain an independent church and it is an autonomous and autocephalous church of India. That is That's so it. fascinating. That is <laughs> indeed very fascinating, yes. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, usually the the seminar comes to an end now. If you, but we can extend it now. So if you if you want to have discuss more questions, um, Sihan or Joe, uh, I can see that um, also Richard is uh, has dropped out. I'm sure his internet is too weak. Joe, yes, please. Um, yes, if I may, um, I wonder. Is this kind of um, a doctrinal and liturgical development discussed under the headings that are sort of oftentimes brought to African Christianization or Africanization of Christianity, like, um, um, you know, uh, um, some uh, uh, syllogy and, um, um, af, um, a sort of a weird, uh, and uh, is it a, a understood as just a normal natural development, or is there a branch of um, of of a philosophy which tries to distinguish that version of Orthodox Christianity as different from and lacking in comparison to? The traditional structures. Uh, I, I know you. I, I, it's, it's not very clear to me. I'm sorry. Uh, could you could you make uh, it a little clearer? And then, uh, uh, I did. Uh, is it about pardon. the Orthodox? Uh, is it about the Orthodox identity of the of the Indian Orthodox Church or? Uh, no. So so every time you in in the African context when people no. when people um, <laughs> adapt the the liturgical and theological processes from. Oh the ones that came with so for for example we also had the portuguese as well and the dutch mm -hmm. and then the english in almost the same way um mm -hmm. every time there's um, a move to indigenize the that or or to africanize oh, okay them. okay okay in in, 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 in uh, the situation in africa and the situation in the in the malangara or the, the traditional Syrian christian community are quite different because in africa christianity came to their own uh, to their own social cultural situations and then they adapted, they accepted Christianity and they tried to bring indigenous elements into their practice of their religion, which they recently accepted. But in St. Thomas Christian community, the culture developed together with them. The presence of Christianity was there in India in the early, since, since the early centuries. Since. So they, they, they developed their system. They, they didn't adapt it. We don't have any evidence. We don't have any evidence how they adapted when they became Christians in, in the early centuries. And they maybe, uh, maybe and according to our, our traditional belief in the first century itself. So the 20th centuries of the cultural development in Kerala and cultural evolutions in Kerala happened them being a part of the society. So there was no question of an adaptation or there was no question of, a, of an integration of a culture or indigenization because it is already naturally indigenized and then, then the process of indigenization 
happened was quite in a different manner because it took too long a time for these people. And then uh, many of the people say that, you know, with the integration or indigenization of the Keralite society, because the Sundavas Christians are uh, quite an interesting area we can study if you, if anyone of you wish to, because it is, it is not something which happened in a short span of time, but it is something which happened through the development of the culture. That means that practically the culture of Kerala developed them being present and them being a part of the process of the development of it. So it's kind of, um, it's a natural development that occurs over two millennia rather than- Yes, 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 of course. And that culture developed with their contribution too. Their role was there in the development of the culture too. So it was not, it was, it was not an integration or it was not a, an indigenization, but the culture developed uh, uh -huh. They had their own role in the development of the culture. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I mean, this, this is uh, <clears throat> this uh, lecture and the discussion that has been uh, an eye opener when it comes to uh, both the social structure, the uh, linguistic uh, complexity, um, and the uh, also the historical development of uh, of the. Um, uh, Christian community in Kerala and the, the even after the um, uh, independence, you know, the um, from 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 Britain. So um, the, yeah. I I have uh, uh, if because I know Kerala a little bit, for, uh, but just as a visitor, and I uh, I would have liked to spend more time there. And the uh, you, I'm you are most welcome. Yes, I, <laughs> thank you. Yes, <laughs> uh, and the 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 way I come across. Um, Kerala in my studies is actually through the, the Portuguese, so it takes us back to that, but I don't want to go out about this. This is um, uh, uh, something that uh, interests me <laughs> anyway. Uh, but um, I, I think we should uh, put the, um, uh, the put to stop here, and um, if there are no more questions, um, I know that it can happen that um, members um, uh, of the uh, our center that they write in. In this case, I'm going to pass on the, the questions to you. And um, th this is um, uh, because these are, it's a very, um, not, not just interesting, it's actually a vital part of uh, what we understand as world Christianity, because this is, uh, takes us back to the beginnings of Christianity, when, uh, you know, uh, Christian groups really spread out over the whole world. And uh, uh, the south of India is, in a way, a logical con in, uh, extension of this, because uh, it goes uh, across the sea to, to the first land, uh, to the first beach that they see. So this is the, um, th this is, um, uh, to me, it is uh, only logical that the church would have um, taken root there. Um, yes. Anyway, um, I'm extremely grateful that you found the time to speak to us, and um, I uh, would like to uh, welcome you as a permanent member of our uh, of our center. Is your see so you, if you have any of, uh, at any further uh, at any future point in time, if you would like to join us for a seminar, then uh, please let us know. Thank you. So thank you very much, and uh, also I'm happy, thank you. I'm happy to participate in the in the, in the seminars in which I'm. Uh, you know, the, um, I have to be a little, uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the topics and if I will be very happy if you could send me the topics sometime when yes. you, uh, if, if, if I will be happy if you could include me also in your yes. emailing list. Yes, I'll be I, happy. Will, I will do that uh, this afternoon. Uh, as soon Thank as you. the server works again, because this has been out of action now for some time, but uh, I, I, I'm... Yes, we have to, we have to trust God that this will become, uh, if not the university authorities. Uh, anyway, so thank you very much, and um, I, I would like to wish you a very nice evening. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you. thank you. Goodbye, and also goodbye to the others, except for Joe. Goodbye. <laughs> yes. Goodbye. Yes. Okay, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.